Good afternoon. My name is Peter Goldsworthy, and it's uh, my pleasure and honour tonight to moderate the last session in Edinburgh Rise Week at Melbourne. And uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the land we're on, particularly given the subject tonight, perhaps, of uh, post-national literature. It's a traditional land of uh, people of the Kulin Nation, especially the Wurundjeri and the Boonawurrung people who used to meet ex at this exact spot. And I'd like to acknowledge their continuing connection and uh, custodial care of the land. I'd also like to point out the empty chair uh, to my right. Melbourne Writers Festival supports International Pen Melbourne, an organisation working on behalf of writers who are imprisoned, tortured, threatened, attacked or exiled, and probably also gas-bombed, um, or exiled for the peaceful practice of their professions. The empty chair at festival events represents a, white, a writer who could not be here because of these circumstances. Now, the way that the, uh, these sessions are structured is there will be a keynote address for uh, about 20 minutes, and uh, I'll introduce it. Tony Birch, who will be delivering that in a sec. And then following that, there's a discussion uh, between uh, Tony and MJ Highland. I'll in introduce uh, MJ Highland at the conclusion of Tony's address. Look, it's a real pleasure to introduce Tony. Um, he's one of those writers, I remember when I first read anything of his, it was a short story, and it was 10, 13 years ago, and it hit me between the eyes. I even wrote him a fan letter, or gave him a fan. And that's very rare for me, I'm usually too jealous <laughs> to write. <laughs> Um, fan letters, but it's wonderful when you hear a voice you haven't heard before, particularly with the, the unsentimental emotional power that that story had. And uh, I couldn't believe he'd get better after that, but he has continued getting better. His short story collections are uh, Shadow Boxing. Your boxing played a big part in Tony's childhood, as perhaps many of you know, a bit uh, like the leader of the oppositions. But if uh, Tony tells me I'm talking too much and to shut up, I can assure you I am going to shut up tonight. It's, uh, and Father's Day is uh, the other short story collection. But for those of you who haven't read it, I can't praise his recent novel, Blood, highly enough. It's one of those rarities, a novel that maintains the power and density of a short story to the bittersweet end. A new collection of stories is out next year and I can't wait to see what he's up to. It's, uh, I'd say it's, it's been pretty bad these last six months waiting for Breaking Bad to come round again, but I think that's going to be even worse. Tony Birch. Um, uh, thank you very much, Peter, for, for that um, generous introduction and, and also to MJ coming back to Australia to, to give me a hug. Um, she's here for other more important things, I think, but it's great to see her again. Um, and a way of also paying recognition to the Wurundjeri people, um, I do want to say that one of my heroes in life was William Barrack, a man who was a 13-year-old boy at the attempted signing of the so-called Batman Treaty in 1835, and William Barrick was a man who lived to see Federation in 1901. He passed away in 1903. And William Barrick, in a way, might represent, I suppose, a philosophy and ethics that I take to my writing, and that is to accept the reality of negotiation, to accept the reality of sometimes having to adopt strategies that may sit outside what might be a more assertive political belief, but also to accept the potential for reconciliation in a real sense, not in a capital R sense. And he was a man, I think, who led the way for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And I love the fact that we're here by the Yarra River, and I talked to Peter earlier, my novel that I'm working on is called Ghost River, which is about the Yarra, and when the colonial authorities attempted to shift William Barrack from his father's country, he said, um, there is no place in the mountains for me. The river is my father's country. And it's the place that he always related to most centrally. So I, I do this in respect to William, but also the gesture of, I suppose, an attempt to create a dialogue that, that includes people rather than excludes people. OK, so here we go. I want to thank the Melbourne Writers' Festival for allowing me the opportunity to recount my personal discovery of the post-national novel. 
The moment occurred on North Richmond Railway Station in 1971 when I was 15 years old. I'd just been expelled from school after falling through a shop window in a fight with another boy. I was a slightly built boy at the time but was never bullied as my father had taught me to box and to punch above my weight. While his training held me in good stead in the street, it equipped me for little else. I was an angry teenager prone to setting all disputes with my fists. I had been taught by the Christian brothers in primary school. I was a good student who thrived in the highly regulated atmosphere as opposed to the chaos of my home life. Such was not the case at the state high school I later attended. We were left to our own devices and vices by a group of young teachers fresh out of university fueled by the politics of the anti-war movement. Although I learned little in high school, I remained a voracious reader. I'd held a public library card from the age of five and picked up second-hand paperbacks wherever I could. On the day of my expulsion from school, my train was cancelled and I had a further half hour to wait. I retrieved a novel from my bag that I had just borrowed from the library. Barry Hines' A Kestrel for a Knave was published in 1968. It is set in a depressed working class north of England, geographically a long way from inner Melbourne. Those around him, a bullying older brother, schoolyard thugs and a psychopathic teacher, repeatedly whacked Billy Casper, the slightly built boy at the centre of the novel. His respite from violence is discovered in his love for a bird, a headstrong but graceful kestrel, and in the wonders he takes to a nearby wood, itself a relief from the grime of coal mines, slag heaps and narrow overcrowded terraces of the town. I'd read many novels by the time I picked up Kets. My older brother was a champion at many sporting pursuits, including football, handball, marbles and any game requiring skill and sharp reflexes. But he was no student of literature. So despite my relative delinquency, I was his scholarly proxy, devouring his English school texts, including Catcher in the Rye, Travels with My Aunt, and To Kill a Mockingbird. I penned his lit essays and would have sat exams in his place had I been half a foot taller. No book left the impression on me that Kez did. I was convinced it had travelled the world to find me. From the first pages when Billy wakes in the early morning in his damp, crowded room and is teased and abused by his older brother, I felt more than empathy for him. I was Billy Casper. When my train finally arrived, I continued reading. After I got off the train, I headed home, open book, walking into light poles as I went. Buried deep in the novel, I headed straight for my bedroom and finished it. Closing the final page, I rushed from the house, ran through the narrow streets of my life. I didn't stop until I reached the banks of the Yarra River. At the time, a maligned and neglected stretch of water home to car wrecks, the homeless and neglected, and water rats. I lay in the long grass on the riverbank and thought more about the book until I became so excited I ran back home and began reading again. That night I broke the expulsion news to my mother. She shrugged her shoulders dismissively. Clearly the information was of little surprise to her. She sternly instructed me to get a job in a week or I'll find one for you. And I did find gainful employment as a telegram boy riding push bike across the city. Whenever I could pinch a few minutes, I would ride along the back lane, a back lane and sit and read. I was never without a paper back in my pocket. Around this time, I was arrested out the front of a local dance hall. Along with some mates, I was lined up against a brick wall and searched by the police. The subsequent discovery included half bottles of vodka, flick knives, a touch of mascara and lipsticks to enhance the collective glam rock persona, and a suspicious article in the back pocket of my powder blue flares. A copper pulled it out and shoved it in my face. What the fuck's this, hard boy? Um, it's a novel, The Outsider by Albert Camus. He hit me over the head with the book. I've never heard of him, you smart ass. This potted history of my life of crime, punishment and books does little more than state the obvious. Good fiction has traditionally impacted through its ability to transcend boundaries of class, ethnicity and collective identity. Even, as with my experience with Kess, a story deeply embedded and invested in the regionalism of Northern England. 
Barry Hines and Billy Casper touched my heart in a manner that no Australian book had done at the time or has achieved since. I related to the challenges of inequality that Billy faced. Sadly, I also related strongly to his sense of shame. It is a shared experience and emotion of those relegated to the social and economic scrap heap. You keep your head down, just as Billy does, ashamed of your own identity and burdened with the discrimination society is too often strategically blind to. We do not need a national literature to draw attention to issues of the human condition or the heart in Australia. As my experience of Kess indicates, good writing migrates and finds a home. Granted, there have been novels published in recent years in Australia that draw attention to vital issues of a domestic nature. Michelle de Cresta's multi-award winning Questions of Travel is such an example. And of course, it will travel and impact on global readers interested in both good writing and the plight of the globally stateless. An issue central to a discussion of both national and post-natural fiction in Australia is Aboriginal writing and writing about Aboriginal people which can be interrelated or mutually exclusive. Historically, Aboriginal writers of fiction have produced, if not definitively anti-nationalist writing, at least a sharp critique of an inclusive and collective sense of identity that pervades popular culture and the politics of populism. White Australia's 20th century approach to the so-called Aboriginal problem was dominated by the twin policies of child removal and limited assimilation. In attempts to legitimate dubious and often cruel policies, successive governments, national and state, utilised the spectre of the half-caste menace to support violence, the violence underpinning assimilation. Not surprisingly, Aboriginal writers have focused on issues of identity, the politics of colour and the hypocrisy of miscegenation, first interrogated in the seminal wildcat falling by Colin Johnson in 1965, a novel presenting an unflattering and tragic portrayal of the modern half-caste conveyed through the experiences of a young man emotionally and culturally detached from society. The novel represents the failure of an obsessive national identity project. No other writer in Australia, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, would apply a similar literary critique to assimilation until Kim Scott's award-winning Benang in 1999. The novel, which ranges across the period of Aboriginal protection under the leadership of A.O. Neville, the chief protector for Aborigines in Western Australia in the first half of the 20th century, is subtitled From the Heart. And it is with heart and humour and pathos that Scott lances the festering sore of assimilation, exposing its devastating impact on individuals families and communities. Other Aboriginal writers have since produced intelligent and engaging portraits of the nation through fiction that defies a shallow reading of the national story. This list includes the works of Alexis Wright, Bruce Pascoe and Melissa Lukashenko, amongst many others. Wright, in her novels Carpenteria, also a Miles Franklin winner, and the recent The Swan Book, provokes Australians to come to terms with the impact of British occupation on Aboriginal land and people. Her writing provides more than a critique of a dominant national story. She's offering a refreshing way of engaging with place and people, be they the first inhabitants of this land, or as with de Kretz's work, the plight of the displaced. Such novels are perhaps a version of national fiction looking beyond the nation. In recent years, the wider literary community in Australia has celebrated Aboriginal writing, although it continues to be received and consumed at times defensively within a mindset stuck in the colonial imagination. I call this the disloyalty effect, whereby particular critics, commentators and readers respond to what they feel is a negative critique of the national story or even an act of ingratitude. The degree of disloyalty is compounded when the story is delivered by so-called mixed blood Aboriginal writers, who are, after all, the wayward children of the benevolent nation. There are those, of course, who understand the potential for Aboriginal writing to productively shift the national story. Geordie Williamson, literary critic of the Australian newspaper, in his review of Wright's The Swan Book, commented on the 
urgent importance of the novel and the themes it tackles, going far beyond the borders of a national story and dealing with issues such as climate change, refugees and the outsider. The Swan Book is an ideal example of post-national fiction. Both Scott and Wright are widely read outside Australia, particularly in Europe where their work is translated. Global readers are not invested in, Australia, in an Australian fiction that underpins an unwritten Patriot Act. Let me be clear, Aboriginal writers in Australia are not alone in this achievement. To argue such a point would invalidate the impact that a Kestrel for a Knave had on a 15-year-old boy, both lost and in love with books. It would also be, display a deep dis level of disrespect for both writers and readers enjoying this festival. I would argue, though, that too many Australians remain ignorant of the creative and intellectual reach of Aboriginal writing, knowing little beyond the degree to which it serves us and fits within a national narrative. In February this year, I was invited by Screen Australia, along with a group of Aboriginal writers, to spend a week at Uluru with the acclaimed film writer and novelist Guillermo Arriaga. Amongst other achievements recognised with a BAFTA nomination and a Cannes Festival of Award for the Free Burials of Melchiadas Estrada, Ariaga wrote the screenplays for Babel, 21 Grams and Amoros Peros. He has visited Australia previously and has a passionate interest in Aboriginal storytelling through both writing, film, fiction and drama. In several conversations I had with Guillermo, he returned to the same point. While he was excited that Aboriginal writing introduced him to Australia's domestic story, it also spoke directly to and resonated with him most particularly in providing him with an additional insight into the story of his own country, Mexico. He was not referring to Indigenous issues, but human issues. He is also adamant that Aboriginal writing was some of the bravest he'd met when choosing subject matter and how it was shaped into story. It speaks to the world, he said over and over again. Before concluding with a comment on two books that have influenced me greatly, I want to briefly discuss the elephant in the room. This elephant impinges on discussions of both Aboriginal writing in Australia and writing about Aborigines. I want to offer a position that I hope is helpful and pertinent when contemplating both a national and post-national literature for this country. I've been teaching at university for close to 20 years now. I also regularly appear at writers' festivals. It is rare for an event concerned with Aboriginal writing to pass without the question coming from the floor. Can non-Aboriginal people write Aboriginal characters? The question is posed. Let me dispose with the mundane and move on to something hopefully more productive. Firstly, the point is moot. Non-Aboriginal authors have been writing about Aboriginal people for more than 200 years and enough of them will continue to do so in the future. As a writer and educator, I'm far more interested in questions such as in what way do non-Aboriginal writers portray Aboriginal characters in fiction and what might be the intellectual and creative motivation behind such writing. Secondly, and problematically, many would-be writers who ask this question are seeking absolution and endorsement, a misguided notion on two counts. If the Aboriginal writer endorses the would-be writer's right to create to creative expression, a beaming smile appears on the face of the would-be writer. He or she has been saved, cleansed, and suddenly become entitled. If an endorsement does not follow the question, perhaps with a blunt comment, don't do it, the would-be writer is prone to either breaking down in tears or verbally attacking the Aboriginal writer. My point is simple. Please do not ask as refusal may offend. If I were to offer any advice, it would be that the responsibility for what is written sits with the author, totally. When I feel uneasy about subject matter, I come to a clear decision to tackle the material and hopefully do it justice or leave it alone when I don't feel equipped to write about it. This, by the way, is the reason I've never written about sex. <laughs> what I would like to say, which I hope is a more generous point, one that I hold with conviction, is that there are many non-Aboriginal writers in Australia who have produced vitally important novels dealing with Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal relationships. Just a few of those writers include Randolph Stowe, Alex Miller, Kate Grenville and Peter Goldsworthy. 
Other writers have failed the task miserably, unable to rise above two-dimensional stereotypes, sentimentality, moral superiority, or guilt, sometimes in the one book. But our measuring stick must be novels of quality, the stories that attempt to question and shift the culture. So I guess I want to have a bet each way here. I like stories about this place, this country, but not stories that do little more than mimic the rah-rah of the sporting field. Nor those that want to uphold a shallow lie about this country, even when posing as fiction. I also want to read stories that travel like a bird I adore, the Arctic tern, which bravely navigates the globe each year to nest on the beaches of southern Australia. So finally, I want to mention two heroic texts. When I read Juno Diaz's first book, his 1996 link story collection, Drown, I had a similar experience to that on discovery of Kes. I was a lot older, calmer and more settled. Here was a book set in both the Dominican Republic and New Jersey that again spoke to my heart and head. Once I had put the book down, I understood that it was time to stop scribbling around with the occasional poet, poem, nothing against poets, but I was a hobbyist, I think, and short story and try to become a proper writer. For better or worse, Diaz is responsible in part for my first book, Shadowboxing, a link story collection following the life of Michael Byrne from child, the childhood badlands of inner Melbourne to an adulthood of resolution. Drown, as with Kess, as with other books I'm sure people in this audience have read and loved, will always transcend the nation. Clearly a post-national literature has always been with us. While preparing for this festival and this event, I've been reading a new book, Ali Alyssa Day's Transactions. It is a story cycle that traverses the globe dealing with the greed and cruelty of rampant capitalism, the displacement and exploitation of vulnerable people and the yearning for a home that exists, not in a slogan, a t-shirt or a pledge of loyalty, but in the blood that flows through the body, in the spiritual resonances that we sometimes attempt to deny. While Transactions has been favourably, favourably reviewed in Australia, we have also been reminded that it is bleak. It is not. It is a book of love, that refuses an early exit. It is a fiction that exposes the prejudices of a violent society. In doing so, this book generally offers us a better way of seeing the world and ourselves. It is truly a book without borders. It is a book to take to the streets, a book to confront the hollow stop the boats mantra of Tony Abbott, and a book to confront the human rights abuses against refugees enacted by the Rudd Labor government. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, look, I think it's worth the price of admission just to hear that wonderful anecdote of the cop plucking the copy of the Camus novel out of, out of your pocket, hard boy. I think I've dined on that for the last time. <coughs> Camus would have loved it. There's, yeah. there's part of me that wishes the cop had said it's better in French, but I guess that was never going to happen. Um, well, look, I'd like to introduce now to you MJ Highland and... Uh, welcome her to the discussion. And we've been talking, well, Tony was talking about books that meant a lot to him, uh, books that he discovered, both back then with a kestrel um, for a knave, but also some books later on. And I remember, as I do with Tony, I remember when I first read MJ Highland, it was a Melbourne festival, and it was that wonderful first uh, novel of hers, How the Light Gets In, which, you know, was from the wonderful um, song, a current song. But um, she's... Uh, since then, published two more novels. And uh, actually, I'd like to say, if there is a, an Arctic turn among novelists who's just come back to roost on uh, our southern shores, Tony, it's probably Maria, who's uh, really written, her novels are spread over three, three or four continents, and she's lived on three or four continents. She's very much a, a post-national novelist. Uh, after How the Light Gets In, she wrote uh, Carry Me Down, which won the Hawthornden Prize and the Encore Prize and was shortlisted for the Man Booker Award. And then, and very differently, um, her, her most recent novel, uh, This Is How, which is a, a restrained tour de force that actually I think Camus would have loved. And I mean, you can actually almost look at it. I don't know what you think of this, Maria, but 
um, it, it's sort of th almost a, one, from one level, it's a thought experiment of what happened to uh, Musso if he hadn't been guillotined but had been sentenced to life imprisonment. It's a, it's a fabulous novel and uh, I recommend that. But she's also an essayist of note. Uh, like Tony, she's a short story writer of, of note, a prize winning yeah. note. And I'd, but I'd also particularly, perhaps because I'm a doctor, but I'd like to recommend also to you, if you haven't read it, uh, a, a wonderful essay uh, that she wrote in, it was published in Granta magazine some years ago on, uh, on the, how the, her uh, multiple sclerosis first came to be diagnosed. And it's a uh, truly uh, ferociously honest bit of writing. I actually give it to some, some not all, but some of my patients with MS as recommended reading. But uh, so it's a real pleasure to have you here, Maria. Um, and before perhaps I ask you to respond to, uh, to Tony, I might ask you, if, was there a book in your life that meant, as, your, your early life, that meant as much to you, that, or mapped onto your life as much as a Kestrel for a Knave did with Tony? Uh, yeah, and um, um, before this event, so yesterday, um, uh, Tony sent each of, each of us, um, Peter and I, a copy of his, um, of his talk to read before today. And um, I, I was really rushed for some reason or other, and, and, but I opened the document and I started reading it and I couldn't stop reading it. I was, I was transfixed. I think it's a fantastic story. Um, but when uh, um, Tony starts talking about cares, I thought, my God, that was one of the four or five books that floored me when I was about 13, 14. And, um, you know, coincidentally and uh, fascinatingly, um, a few of the other books were also um, set in the north of England, or, or what, what's now are now called kitchen sink dramas, uh, written in the 1950s in in working class uh, England. Um, books like *This Sporting Life* by David Story, um, *The Loneliness, Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner*, uh, Keith Waterhouse's *Billy Liar*, of course. Um, these books um, uh, uh, got to me in a way that um, similarly books uh, like Flannery O'Connor's short stories and uh, books set in sort of uh, the, the South and Gothic kind of fiction from the South, uh, uh, Southern America um, and also Russia. <laughs> um, uh, the short stories of Gogol, Nikolai Gogol, and, um, and also like, uh, of course, Camus, and uh, the authors who write about the gratuitous act, the, the, the man who, or has never been a woman, not yet, um, commits an unprovoked, unpremeditated murder, uh, but cares too, I mean, and, and then the movie, I mean, it's a fantastic adaptation, but it's an interesting thing, I think, that, um, I was, and still am, uh, most enthralled and most enjoy books set in places where I've never had much familiarity. The strange, the place that's strange to me, that's foreign to me, that's other to me. It's, it's interesting you, measure, you mentioned the movie, of uh, the, the Ken Loach movie, which was made of um, uh, Kestrel for a Knave, and I'm just wondering, Perhaps, uh, well, I'll ask Tony, because you, you would have supplied, here's a book that's written largely in a Yorkshire patois, um, but it's the, the circumstances, particularly the working class circumstances and the tough life and the family relationships seem to map onto your life, early life, pretty well. But I wonder if when we're talking about stories that are enduring and transnational or post-national, if it applies as much uh, in movies. Especially, I wonder what you thought of the movie and, and how much the movie displaced your own imagining yeah. of, of the, that world? I mean, it's quite interesting because um, what was immediately apparent about the book, and I, I purposely um, noted the, the river for this because I had a very sort of odd geography as a teenage boy, which was very important here, that I lived behind the Collingwood football ground, yeah. which had this incredible woolen mill along one wall. But once you got beyond that wall, there was this incredibly wild, at the time, Yarra River. So we did live in a bunch of two-storey terraces. There was about 10 of them. And I could go 100 yards and be in the middle of nothing except the river and, you know, car wrecks and things like that. It was a strange mix of industrial ruin and nature. But so just on the book, firstly, that to me was as important as any other element of the book, that these two worlds that collided in the book, it, it immediately... I agree with mm. Maria that, that you... 
you're interested in places that are different. And by the way, people often see me as a realist writer. When I'm writing about the Yarra, my writing about the Yarra is to turn into something else, not just as I see it. I want it to be a bit unreal. But when I saw... The, I didn't see the Loach film until some years later, and I suppose because I worship at the feet of Ken Loach, it would be hard to be critical anyway. I love it when he's, they, people say he's bleak as well. I love that criticism. I, I mean, bleak is good, but... I actually, what's interesting about the book is those scenes where there were some panning shots of the coal mines and the slag heaps, and then when he takes this beautiful walk through nature and he sees a twitcher, I think a bird watcher, that seemed to me to fit with what I'd known. I found the movie a bit more comical, like the football match, which is hilarious. I thought in some moments of the book, the comic nature... It was overplayed to yeah. some extent. Maybe I just like bleak, bleak, and Loach wanted a bit of humour. <laughs> but, but still, it, it was some years later for me, and I think the important question there is of how we read, and for me, building a visual picture into the, the book was more important than... So when I saw the film version, I didn't feel invalidated. Maybe I was a bit older at that time. I just feel, well, yeah, that's a different version. Yeah. And, of course, the other thing, if you're talking... You know, Trans, how work transcends. The other, if you, anyone goes back to that book and read the opening, when he wakes up in the morning, it's freezing cold, the room is pitch black and crowded, and his brother's pinched his blankets. And I mean, that. They share a bed. You could, you could do that anywhere because I shared a bed with my older brother till I was 10, and he would do that. So that. To me, well, that was yeah. written in the Collingwood Terrace. I think, I, think, I think what Tony said just then, that the, the um, Cares is a marvellous novel. If you haven't read it, really, uh, must read it. Although, although it was written uh, more than uh, 50 years ago, um, Tony just said it then, that what it opens with a description of, um, you know, abject poverty, boys growing up in houses, there are not enough beds to go around, and they share a bed, and there's some cruelty. His brother is slightly older than him, and, and he's, there's a mistreatment, so there's a, there's, it's a tragic novel. It's a fantastic, visceral, tragic novel. And Tony just said, but it could happen anywhere. And, and that's the kind of fiction I think is best that place doesn't really matter. And I think it was just sheer coincidence that of the stories that really uh, got under my skin and, and uh, stayed with me were set, many of them were set in the north of England. But the stories, when I look back at those stories, what's powerful and, and, and tremendous about them is that the tragic underpinnings, the good narrative, the good plot, people rubbing up against each other and disastrous consequences and conflict between people could happen anywhere. Indeed, place is irrelevant, and they're the books I like best. You could move, you could transpose the story to any setting, and as long as you have those same people or those types of people, those characters doing what they do to each other, it could happen anywhere in the world, and I hate descriptions of scenery. So... <laughs> Loathe them. So, I mean, sticking to colliery country, what about D.H. Lawrence? So that's the kind of... Too much description. Uh, yeah, that's what you'd say. That. Well, I, to me, I would have assumed at some stage that also that you would have been looking for uh, escapism in um, whether it's some earlier on the magic faraway tree or something like that, when you're talking about difficult childhood and... Uh, yeah, that's like the, the descriptions in those books, like fairy tale compared to what I was putting up with, but that's another story. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it wasn't uh, escapism. No, it didn't feel like that. What, what, the, the, no, what, what was it? It was the power of the story, of the, of the what happens, of the, of the, you know, what Aristotle said remains true, you know, great drama, great tragedy is a character in pursuit of their one true goal. In the case of Kez, it's the, the bird and the freedom to fly with the bird, to get away from his stinking family. And uh, it's that drama, the unfolding of the drama, and, and I, I love the story. I love being told a good story. And so when the, and I started reading the Russians, similarly, they, they told me a good story and they got on with it. And Flannery O'Connor, with her desperately abject, you know, stories like, a good man is hard to find when the misfit slaughters a family on the side of the road with her southern manners, the style is kind of gentle and reserved, not quite reserved, but 
um, almost patrician and careful, and then she has these great vi these violent stories. I mean, it's, it's a story that could happen anywhere. I mean, the other, <clears throat> the other issue in escapism, I mean, I think it's not where all writers come from, but I didn't look to books for escapism. I created world, worlds of escape. Mm. So I was very... Um, I couldn't sleep at night. I still can't. Too Probably much makeup. Um, my, I don't know if my wife's here. She was coming, but our 12-year-old Staffordshire Terrier jumps in the bed halfway during the night and you can't sleep because she won't... She snores. But anyway, that's another story. Not my wife, the dog. Um, <laughs> my, mine's got pancreatitis and she vomits in the middle of the night. But, yeah. I couldn't sleep of the night. So I used to create these, what I call now scenarios, these whole imaginary worlds. And it's quite interesting because in those worlds, it's not surprising there was a boy who becomes heroic and he saves everyone and then everyone lives happily ever after. And they're complete fairy tales and fantasies. But I could actually, I could create them to a level where I found both comfort in them and within that bed of a night, um, they were very comforting. And yeah, that go back to the thing of sleeping with my older brother, I actually loved it because I would sleep against the wall and then my brother would sleep there and I loved cuddling into his back or having that sort of security blanket. But the other escape even which is relative to this book is because of the great fortune as a young teenager, so when I was about 12 to about 16, of having this Yarra River at my doorstep. And by the way, one at that time that had no bike paths, no beautification, it was even hard to get to. It was a world of escape that was itself both real and, and fantastical. So when you had those days on the river, which we did most weekends, you'd get into a state where I'm going to be here all the time. Yeah, this is it. And then you'd, you wouldn't realise until when, as the sun was going home that you'd have to go home. So those two imaginary worlds in your bed and the one that you could... Not my visit, bed, your bed. I don't yeah, know. What, the your, one you my bed normal. <laughs> not yet. The one that you could physically go to, they were, they were wonderful. And they were happy. I mean... I've written an essay on homelessness, which we're going to talk about at the festival tomorrow morning, and I was a bit hesitant to write this, but when I was writing the essay on homelessness recently, I did what, yeah, a lot of observational stuff, going around the soup kitchens, watching people get their meal, and Peter, I saw two kids about 10 and 12, it was a bitterly cold in about May, the boy had a, a sausage roll and the girl had a pasty, and they were with their mum and she looked really sort of struggling. But when the kid got his pasty and she got the sausage roll, they were skipping up and down the street. And they were happy in that moment. And when I saw that, I thought, despite the reality of poverty, for a lot of the time as a kid, you create happiness for yourself. And it lasts beyond the reality. Mm. So even if you've got to invent the idea that that past is going to last forever, you make sure that you can create a sense of happiness for yourself and you hold on to it for as long as you can. And that's what I did as a kid. And I think for me, that clearly is what motivated writing. And to bring it back to these novels, I agree entirely with MJ that, you know, these stories, they did come to us from everywhere, from all over the place. We, we in a sense, talking about pre-national literature, that is, or even you know, oral literature, the, the stories that are part of our common human nature and every, the stories that every culture shares, whether they're quest stories or what have you, are these... I actually think these are inscribed in our, in our DNA, the templates for these, there's a deeper grammar of them. But, and so, of course, they're transnational. But is it, how, how important is it, we love also reading about local texture with these stories. How important, for instance, would you say, Maria, how is it important in your first novel that, that uh, the girl goes to America as an exchange? Uh, you know, given, let's just to pick a locale, for instance. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose um, that, that that's interesting because uh, uh, I chose America not because I wanted to describe America in geographical terms. In fact, I don't even bother to do that. And I uh, set in Chicago, a place I'd never been. And uh, But it, I wanted to talk about uh, somebody who has a fantasy of leaving a, a life of impoverishment, a slum, and living in a richer life with smarter people with books in their house. So uh, it's about a girl with an, an enormously, stupidly, disgustingly high IQ who screws her life up and ends up in a prison. Uh, but it's about interrogating that idea of the American dream, the promise uh, that uh, if you're smart enough in a country like America and you do the right things, uh, you can have what you ask for, what you need and what you want, which is utter and 
total rubbish, as we know. So when I say I wanted to interrogate that, I wanted to use that to write a good story and a, a sort of tragic story. I didn't do it quite as I, I, I ought to have, and I, I wish I had done a better job. And I've come back to that same idea uh, with each novel, and I hope a little better each time, uh, of the idea of you know, chasing uh, tran transformation and the lies involved in that. We're going to, in a couple of minutes, open up for, Q, you know, for kind of Q&A, so I hope uh, ready, ready your, your questions, if you could. Can I just... Um, the other thing I should say is that um, having sent the essay yesterday, I was going to revise it. I had to go to... I mean, this is telling, so I'm, I'm going to expose myself as a, a fraud here and then jump out the window. Um, one of the things I did yesterday after I finished this was I went over to the university book room, but partly to do some administration stuff. And then I was walking along the bookshelves of the prescribed texts, and I first saw, I saw Wake and Fright there, the great Kenneth Cook novel. And clearly, um, my essay in that sense, or the comment, it's a bit fraudulent in the sense that what it didn't address is the fact that there have been, or not address enough, there have been important books that both address what we might call a national story and critique it. I suppose what I'd, I'd want to say about it is that I'm not pro or... It's not an issue about whether you think a national literature is important or not. I actually think it is important, or there is a place for it. It is that I don't... I suppose... I think we want to be sure that we don't produce books that just um, celebrate and don't question if we're going to be mature as a nation, we've got to ask questions of ourselves and we've got to confront issues of ourselves and even books that you know, are so-called for pleasure. And I think Cook's novel is, is quite interesting because even though it, it occasionally might appear to be a bit hysterical in some of the situations, it's, for the time that was written in trying to confront issues of you know, masculinity and its effect on men in a negative sense, trying to confront the issue of alcohol, and its negative impact on men, that is one of, I'd say, well, this is a, to me also a landmark book because I think that one of the things in Australia is those sort of questions that, as part of us, we need to be putting the attention to and I think that was a great book that did it. So there, there, there are other books that, um, I'm not trying to make a general statement about saying, well, this hasn't been done here or I don't appreciate these stories. And Peter, I mean, do the audience questions have to relate to the topic or can they be about anything that people would like to ask about? Well, we'll try and stick to, stick to the topic. Oh, but, damn. <laughs> but it's an interesting point, I think, and you talked about Wildcat Falling uh, in, yeah. in your speech, and obviously there are important books that change the zeitgeist uh, of a nation. You know, there are important books nationally. Uh, and every nation has those well, that's, at certain key points. I think that's the point. I mean, it's interesting with Wildcat Falling, if I could just mention this, and this is how important that book is. There's been a lot of discussion in recent years about Colin Johnson or Mudraroo's identity, which to me is, we could have another session on that. But if you look at the foreword of that book, it is so telling. Here's a book published in 1965. Mary Durack, a benevolent supporter of Aborigines, writes a foreword almost pleading with the reader to read the book. And she says, here is a half-caste man who has risen above the fringe-drawing existence of some Aboriginal people. So in other words, saying, read him because he is worthy and he is, he's moved away from that. Which is interesting, that's the complete opposite to what the book does. And yeah, that notion that Colin Johnson wrote about of mixed blood people always being in the shadows, mm. that metaphor of the shadow. When I read the book, which wasn't too many years later, it was one where I thought, he got it. My father's generation, which is his generation, these are Aboriginal men and women who were placed in the no man's land, between existences, and for a lot of their young life, they didn't have an identity, or they didn't have an identity they could articulate. And I think his book, again, it's not a national text in that sense, it's a critique of a national story that doesn't fit anymore. Yeah. But, uh, look, I might just ask also, well, Maria, you're, if, like me, you're a fan of Flannery O'Connor, but let, uh, let's talk about a different book from the South and one that uh, has, there's been some revisionism about, but it, it seems to me it's a book that completely changed the zeitgeist in the US and that's To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, you know, it gets criticism for being a little bit paternalistic or un Uncle Thomas, but that book, I personally think, did 
as much as anything to change white attitudes in America by, you know, just by selling 45 million. I wonder, perhaps you'd like to comment on Tony on a, uh, how important a book like that is to a national, you know, a so-called national, just to get back from post-national, is that a national, particular national bit of national literature? Yeah. And, it's and politically it, important. Yes, absolutely, yeah, very much so. And it, and it stands in place in America in terms of when people are asked, uh, there are surveys conducted in America. What is your favorite American novel? To Kill a Mockingbird is always in the top five, often number one. Uh, similarly, um, Cloud Street occupies that space uh, in Australia. How, how different those books are, and yet how, how profound they both are, how, dis how, um, how vivid in terms of place, and also what they say about how people behave in uh, the two, two very different cultures and two different times. But To Kill a Mockingbird, unfortunately, uh, because Atticus Finch, the lawyer, is a, is a wonderful um, human being, a, a great figure, a good man, made me think that studying law might be a good thing to do and I could be like Atticus Finch and be a good lawyer. And, save people and do good things and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, when you finish your degree, which is a good degree to do, uh, I didn't meet anybody who even remotely resembled Atticus Finch. <laughs> Not even a tiny little bit. Not even <laughs> close to Atticus. So I'm a bit pissed off with that book. Um, it kind of, uh, yeah, it gave me a, a dream, an idea, a kind of sense of, uh, idealized sense of what might be if, uh, if I did a law degree. I'm half joking. No, I'm not. I'm not joking at all. Um, but what a wonderful book and how, what a difference, how it changed things. Um, books, you know, other books uh, had a um, you know, similar power. And I'm, we're talking about, I'm talking about American fiction, which may not seem right somehow or appropriate in this setting here, uh, but um, things like um, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, having people understand or get inside the mind of a criminal, which was a very, very unusual thing, most so, of course, uh, Camus' character in The Outsider, and then The Executioner's Song, uh, yes. Expiration of a Man on Death Row, and how he's humanized in that book, you know. So they're, 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 they're incredibly important books to me as well. And the other thing about To Kill a Mockingbird, I suppose it is a book that you've got to, um, you've just got to be conscious of the intelligence of your reader so that I understand the, the criticisms and the critiques of the book, and I'll get on to the evils of Atticus Finch also in a moment, but um, I still think it's such an important book, and it's a book that as you become maybe more literate or older, you engage with it at different levels. So, yeah, my 15-year-old daughter, Nina, she did the book this year at school and she loves Scout and Jam and et cetera, and as she reads a book at a different age, and me reading the book because she was doing it, again, I learned something more about the book. So it really is about saying, the book's neither this or that, it's about the, the complex levels of engagement with it. But just to finish with Atticus Finch, and I, I wrote, um, to Kill a Mockingbird into Blood is that in that novel I used, it talk about invention, Peter, I decided that Atticus Finch was my father at one <laughs> point, which was only underpinned when I saw Gregory Peck in the movie talk about influences, and I thought, well, no, my, my dad is a bit of a tr trouble, so Atticus Finch was my, my father for many years, so... I thought, I've huh. got this wise paternal man, and if any kid in Collingwood or Fitzroy gives me trouble, he's going to come out and shoot them. <laughs> uh. That's actually, back to movies, it's interesting though, we were, talk, we're back in now in the, in the post-national literature, and clearly, although To Kill a Mockingbird was an important national book in, in one country, it has post-national kind of ripples that echo across the world and still do, uh, however dated some, sometimes to some people it may seem. And I think that's fascinating. But back to the movies, I was just thinking when you were saying that about, not, not about that movie, but back to the Ken Loach uh, version of um, uh, A Kestra for a Knave. Um, that bombed in America. And one of the reasons apparently uh, you know, it bombed was because of the, the Yorkshire accents. And I, I wanted to ask you, when you read that book, or both of you, when you were young, did you, did you hear the Yorkshire accents or did you kind of, is it like subtitles, you sometimes you hear them speaking Australian? Or, or, 
Well, I wonder, uh, is that, is that, is that might be impossible I question. couldn't have heard of Yorkshire accent because I'd never heard Jeff Boycott <laughs> speak and he was the only Yorkshireman that I knew that came to Australia. It's interesting that I didn't, I didn't, I can't remember having all that much difficulty with it. And in a way, maybe when you read and you, you know, there's words that I couldn't grasp or a particular vernacular that you couldn't grasp, basically, and I've always done this, I don't worry about it. I get the overall sense of what's trying to be conveyed. Um, and when I saw the film, I suppose it did highlight a quite a specific nature of the culture. We, I'm hearing the voice that I hadn't heard before. But again, I think if it transcends, the emotional journey is the most important. Yeah. The rest of it, like when I read, um, if you read Juno Diaz's um, Drown, there's a glossary at the back. I didn't know it was there <laughs> until I'd read the book three times. When I read the book, there were terms that I wasn't sure, but that's like a poem. Yeah. You're not sure what the word means, but you, you give it space and you work with it next time. So I think I had a, a fairly intelligent <laughs> attitude to the book, despite the fact that I was a no-hoper. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I remember um, something that happened to me uh, from a very early age. Uh, if I read a book um, and the character was anywhere in the world, and in a world not mine, so when I was growing up in Dublin, if I read a book uh, set in America or Sweden or wherever it happened to be, um, I would hear that voice. And uh, I told my uh, teacher this, so when I read Cares and when I read Loneliness, a Long Distance Runner and so forth, or that, that was a bit later, um, I told uh, a teacher, I think it was about the third or fourth grade, the very, very first short story I wrote, by the way, was about an ox killing another ox because it was pissed off because the, the farmer was being nicer to the other ox, giving him more food. And uh, it's my very, very first short story. This very, the same teacher who read that ox story, and I, and I told him that when I read stories and the voices, so it's a young boy, say, or an old man or an old woman, it's not me, someone, uh, not a voice that's m my voice, could never be my voice, I heard that voice. So I think that, that was kind of interesting. I didn't, I didn't think it then, but I think now, you know, maybe that was a sign that I had something called an imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Voices come very easily. I mean, I can't do them. I might yeah. try to kind of do my own accent. I mean, you know, I can't, you know, do accents. I can't, but in do, and I'm not a good actor, but I could, I, when I read, I hear the voice, whatever that voice is. Yeah. Male, female, old, young. And I can't, when I write, uh, when, I t when I lived in Melbourne, I lived in Melbourne, as you probably you all know, uh, for nearly 25 years, uh, I couldn't write any fiction set in Melbourne because my imagination failed. It just, nothing happened. It just didn't function. I couldn't invent and concoct and make up stories and make, up, make enough trouble for my characters. It was, it's too familiar, it's too real. And uh, Tony made an interesting comment before, even when he was describing this strange land he grew up in with a football field and a bit of a river and kind of rough and grass and stuff, and then a row of terrace houses, much like the ones that Kez grew up in, uh, the boy in Kez, that, uh, you know, he, he wants to make it, what do you say, a little strange or a little bit unreal well, or dreamlike? I, I had, you I want had to the same something thing. More interesting. Yeah, exactly. So all the, all of the fiction I've written is set somewhere I haven't, I haven't known, especially well. And then I've gotten into trouble when I have. I said, uh, "Carry me down." Uh, the second novel, partly set in the slums of Dublin, a place where I spent a few years in my early childhood. And I was so young when I lived in this high-rise uh, like projects. Imagine high-rise uh, commission flats, the real serious slum. I was very young. I was only four or five years old. And uh, there's a part of the second novel which is set in this slum, these high-rise um, commission flats, council flats. And uh, in the novel, I just make up what it's like there and exaggerate. In terms of what I really remembered from there was the smell of piss in the, in the elevators and the lifts and a few other things. And then I put in details in the novel, like it's overheated, the air conditioning's turned up, the heating's turned up too high, there was pl plans to build a swimming pool which fell through and all the stuff. And then I get letters from people complaining that it's not accurate, it's not true to life. But oh, I, no. I couldn't describe it true to life, even if I had a memory, and I could have done some research and described it as true to life, but that wouldn't have suited the purpose of my story. <laughs> so I, I made it... Uh, I think it's probably transnationally true to life in well, all I projects think, across the world. I think what is transnational, je, je, absolutely, people piss in our elevators everywhere, or everywhere <laughs> all, all over the world. It's one of the universals. 
Um, look, I might invite some questions if uh, people... Is there a roving microphone? I'm not sure. If not, I'll repeat. Yes, there is a roving microphone. I'm happy to repeat any, um, uh, any questions, if not, to either of, the, to either of our guests. Well, I'll put one to you while people are thinking. Uh, you know, perhaps, you know, we, there, there's, a, there's a myth of, the myth of Australian literature, and perhaps Waking Fright addresses it a little bit, but many years ago, the first time I went to Manhattan, and I'd got into a cab, and I'd been in the cab for one minute, and the cab driver said, said you're an Australian. I'm not going to attempt the accent, Maria. Aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, I love Australian movies. Tell you what, I'll tell you a line from Australian movies, and you guess the movie. <laughs> And the first one was, shoot straight, you bastards. Break them around. Break them around. The second one was, of course, that's not a knife. This is a knife. <laughs> Too easy. Yeah. And, the th and the third one was, they're welcome to it. Gallipoli. And all of that's the scene in Gallipoli when uh, the young guys are going off to enlist in the AOF and they meet an old timer on the edge of the desert to ask them where they're going. And they say, we're going to fight the Germans. And they say, why are you going to fight the Germans? And he says, well, if we don't fight them there, they might come here. And the old time looks around and says, they're welcome to it, mate. Um, but that, now it seemed to me, it struck me they had something in common. They address a stereotype, perhaps, of Australian identity um, that maybe, you know, we like, in the laconic, and it's not just a male one. The Germain Greers and the Dawn phrases of the world are part of that larrikin sensibility that we kind of like. It may be a myth. But, but see, what struck me was that whether we've outgrown that myth or and become a lot more complex, whether there are now 23 million identities in this country, there are, of all kinds of mixtures, but the outside world still wants to oppose a national, maybe even literature on us uh, or identity, and other countries too. We all have our stereotypes. I wonder if that's worth uh, any kind of comment. Yeah, I wonder if um, there's something interesting that I've um, I heard, I've recently heard a few agents, literary agents say, and that is that uh, it's become much more the case recently that agents care less and less and publishers to where a writer is from, their age and their gender. And writers too are caring less about those things. And when I thought about it for a second, I thought, aha, uh -huh, it's because of digital publishing, e-books, Kindle and so forth. It's quite often the case that when people start reading a book, that's not visible. The author's photograph, the biog, even the blurb, or where the author's from. Books are picked up, people begin to read them, word of mouth, and they're not hard copy. The hard copy tells you, it's one, you know, people, and pe people tend to, it's a bad habit, but I think we all do it, is open the book up to see who the author is, where they're from, and how old they are. I used to, that was the first thing I used to always do, look up how old the author was, to try and find someone who could, who could be my real father. <laughs> And uh, I found a few people. And so, um, and then, you know, I think that matters, matters less and less. Um, but as for what's happening to Australian literature, whether it in any way is kind of transmogrified or changed or feels any less Australian in any typical way, I think the answer is yes, of course, it, it has changed, has become much more varied in subject matter and style and sensibility because the numbers are going up the numbers of writing, writers. It's a question of sheer numbers, I think. When you look at a country like, you know, um, America, the, the vast number of writers and the history of writing and the number of short stories that get published every year, the number of magazines and books and places to publish, it's, it's about numbers. You get more people writing, bigger population, and that changes what happens to, to literature, uh, you know, beyond any other possible cause or, or reason. Same in England as well. And nationalities becomes more cos cosmopolitan, more um, mixed race, people from everywhere. And you know, the, when I went, went to London in 2004, late 2004, uh, I lived there for a, a year before I ended up in Manchester in the north of England. <laughs> That's where I live now, because it rains 740 days a year. It's beautiful. Uh, it's perfect. And uh, not one person in London asked me where I was from. No one cares where you're from in England. They do here still, interestingly. The, um, I mean, the thing that I, I did mention in the talk is that whether it was when I met Ariaga in um, Uluru, but um, if you look at an organisation like the European um, Studies of Australian Literature, um, when you meet particularly non-English readers 
in Europe or if they come here, one of the things, or one of the issues that attracts them with the sort of contemporary Aboriginal novel is that actually it's not just a critique of nationalism, it actually defies the myths and the stereotypes. It's much more complex mm. and in some ways productively confusing mm. so that they will read a book like Skim Kim Scott's stuff set in the West or Alexis's work set up in the north of Queensland. And what it is is it's so refreshing and so different than that, you know, quoting from three or four movies. It displaces them, but that's what they enjoy about it. And I think, you know, I don't want to be too parochial myself. When, when Guillermo said the Aboriginal writers were the bravest he'd met, you know, everyone's sort of strutting around <laughs> the swimming pool. But the, the point being, I think what he, he liked the way that subject matter for him, it did transcend any national story. And, you know, these kids are growing up in Mexico City with, you know, fighting dogs and in the barrios, and they know Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> and, of course, to get fiction that goes beyond that is, is really exciting. Yeah. But is the, the Larrikin Street, I mean, there's, 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 there's a wonderful Larrikin Street and a lot of indigenous writing that I like mm. too. And that, so there's the, the, the myth, the mythic Bush Australian old stereotype, the laconic, irreverent uh, Larrikin, I think um, su survives and takes different forms as well. Mm. It's, it's just, mm. just one thread in the national narrative perhaps, mm. but it's one I happen to like myself mm. uh, in its new forms as well. Yeah. In indigenous and, films too. I've yeah, and I, I don't disagree. Again, there's no sort of um, thesis here that Aboriginal writers are produ producing simply a critique and that certainly there's a crossover mm. and there is a crossover in, in, in... If you were to take... See, once you go outside ethnicity, if you say, hey, well, how is masculinity dealt with, you'll see similarities in a lot of different cultures of how writers are dealing with within their culture. So notions of privacy, of silence of secrecy, you'll get those, in, those critiques across all ethnicities because there's something particular about masculinity that impacts on any family. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think those, and those are important parts of all, perhaps all national literatures mm. uh, in the West uh, at, at certain stages of its development. Any questions yet? And we'll allow anything, I think, because Maria wants that. Well, this actually is um, on topic. I was going to ask, given this um, discussion that you've been having, that we've been having, I wanted to ask your opinion of uh, Miles Franklin's rules about s stories being Australian and if that even, what that even means anymore. It seems to be, I mean, in my opinion, a, a pretty narrow way of seeing what all of our experiences are. I mean, a lot of Australians aren't even living in Australia and a lot of people living in Australia aren't necessarily Australian. So you've got writers who can win the award who aren't necessarily mm -hmm. from here just because they base a story here. Yeah. And stories that have won that have a very, very narrow, tiny little part that is set in Australia and it manages to win because it has a little bit of Australia in it, but other stories that are brilliant aren't um, at all eligible. I was wondering what your opinions were. Yeah, I, I am, um, well... Start with you on that one. <laughs> Yeah, you I, well, I can't, I, I, even if I did write a novel that uh, was uh, uh, good enough to be considered for Miles Franklin, I, I can't be listed for it because I'm not a, an Australian citizen. Um, uh, and although I lived here for a long time, I didn't take citizenship out uh, because I had no interest in citizenship. Um, in fact, I've, uh, I've never applied for my Irish passport. When it expired, I let it expire and I didn't care anymore. And, I didn't want to call myself Australian, and I don't call myself Irish or English, I have no nationality. But sometimes I think, oh shit, you know, <laughs> maybe I should have um, taken out citizenship because I had, had to come up with a little storyline that I could have put in Carry Me Down where um, John Egan, the little boy who thinks he's a human lie detector, has a fantasy about going to Australia and um, uh, killing a kangaroo or something like that and, and maybe riding a kangaroo and there could have been a bit of Australian content. <laughs> you say riding a, a kangaroo? <laughs> <laughs> Riding one, yeah, mm. you know, like a jockey, <laughs> and uh, and then you know, you know, riding along in the bush and gum, gum trees, and uh, you know. I mean, I so, think look, I, I don't qualify. Any, any, I don't know. Is, is, the de is the definition still applied? Is it still yeah. strictly? I mean, oh, okay. although I, I was clearly robbed when Anna Funda won it, I don't know how much of that novel was set in Australia, but no. <laughs> I mean, any any prize is fine because you know. I found that when I was, seriously, when I was shortlisted for the Miles Franklin, um, things happened that hadn't happened before. I got cab charges sent to me by my publisher, which had never happened before. Um, there was a spike in sales, which had never happened before. Now, um, the bookmaker 
um, Woodhouse, is it, uh, Wood, what's his name? Robbie Wa Waterhouse. Oh, Robbie Waterhouse. Waterhouse. His son, Tom, had me as eight to one outsider, and he was right. I, I came last, even though they don't announce you came last. last. <laughs> My sense of the Mile of Franklin was it publicises writing, there was a lot of events, people involved, you know, get reading out there to the masses, and at that level, it's, it's much more interesting. I think it's more for the commercial marketplace than this for anything else, but, but that's, that, that's all well and good. I think that in regard to the specificity of, of what a novel should represent, it's clear that with writers addressing such an array of material, it would seem odd that some books should or would be disqualified from, from an award, so I think that has to be taken up. But there's also the issue that when I published my second book that Peter mentioned, um, Father's Day, on the front, which was in the second edition, which was a shout line from one of the reviews, and it did get good reviews, it said, quintessentially Australian. Now, again, it sounds good, but it was the oddest thing to see on the front cover. I'd never thought that I was writing a book that was quintessentially anything except bleak. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. So when someone says, oh, this is Australian or it's very essentially Australian, that is something I would never search for, aim for, and I'm not concerned that it was labelled, but it, it seems to be something that, for me, and, has, uh, no, has no creative the, traction. The and and uh, in, in England, sorry, the, the, a tagline like that would never appear on the cover of a, a European book, any European book. Mm -hmm. In England, you'd never see this is, a, you know, quintessentially or typically or... Especially British novel, Welsh. British or what? No, quintessentially no. post-national. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, and 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 uh, the British aren't having conversations about themselves like we are here, having a conversation about what it, what well, might be post post-colonial, post-Australian, post-national literature. It, the uh, English are done with talking about what it means to but, be... But not the Scots. I mean, there's one for less than by... Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Small nationalities tend to do this. But, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. But then we're on the verge of becoming a bigger one, so maybe... You, because you, then it's about defending who you are and, and wanting to make your mark and kind of... There's a, it's provoked by something. But back to that question, I mean, uh, what were your odds on the man booker? <laughs> uh, I know to, they... to lose. I mean, absolutely. It was, it was certain. It was certain, yeah. I put a bet on Kieran Desai. I won quite a lot of money. I also won a lot of money on um, Harold Pinter. You didn't bet on yourself? Oh, no. Mm. <laughs> no, no. And Tony obviously didn't. I, really pride, no. I liked the odds myself. <laughs> no, I had a few bob on Frank Morehouse, which was a disaster. So. <laughs> I also won money on Howard Jacobson. No one saw that coming. I think there was another question. In... Both our guests have um, made mention of their um, childhood and upbringing, and if I've understood them correctly, perhaps ways in which... Uh, those upbringings have uh, informed their, the sensibility of their, of their writing. Um, I wonder if they have a view about um, uh, 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 another view that um, too many writers these days are products of university courses um, devoted to um, novel writing. Well, I, I teach in one of those courses. Both, so. <laughs> both Tony and Maria do teach. At, so it'd be very interesting to hear them on this, having come from. A, I, Not out of that. I, I think that, that there there is an idea that um, the um, I don't know the the vast number of creative writing courses churns out um, awful writing and too much of it and uh, that's not true. It's just there's there's always poor mediocre writing. There's always lots of it. I think that the the real damage that a, um, a bad creative writing program can do is make promises to a writer that that just that can't be delivered. You know, less than one percent of writers will make a career in writing. And um, when we take people on to our course at Manchester University, uh, their entry is by competition, by talent. They have to prove some talent. And we remind them as often as we possibly can. It's a strange paradox to have someone enroll. And in England, education is not free. It's eight thousand pounds for our international students to do a master's course, which is a lot of money. And for our, for our for English students, six thousand pounds. Undergraduates pay six thousand pounds likewise. So anyway, they do this course because they want the rigor, the collegiality of writing among other writers. And at most, we can promise, or this is what I say, 
And I say it over and over, the most I can do is speed up your apprenticeship, but I can't do anything for you if you don't have talent and you won't spend at least three hours a day writing. So, I don't think they do any, any, any real harm. Tony? They shouldn't do anyway. Um, look, I think that I'm, whether I'm saying there's some sympathy for the question, I think what you've got to, I mean, we teach massive undergraduate courses, which I actually think are, are problematic, but I think what you've got to do is firstly... But you encourage reading, though, don't you? Even if it's not just all about writing, no, no, just but, writing classes. But, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, trying to get a university student to read is, you know, like trying to... It's a very hard task. Um, is to make sure that, one, avoid a house style, and I think that some courses, the students are driven to write in a particular way, which is problematic. So when I find students who are a bit all over the place with their writing, but I think there is something distinct in that voice, I'll say to the student, you're all over the place, but you've got something there, and that's what you've got to stick with. The second thing for me is it's a bit different. I don't teach um, novels at all, or novel writing. I teach mostly creative non-fiction, which you can, by the way, do something quite immediate with. So. I teach students who are interested in things outside literature, particularly sport, music, um, politics. Um, I do a lot of writing on, teaching writing on the environment and the ecology to say bring good writing skills to that subject matter. So the long form essay, which I think you can deal with more immediately. But having said that, I think it's the, it's the old age problem. I, I teach at a university and I'm, if there's anyone here from Melbourne University, I apologise in advance um, for this. And, if you want a second, that's okay, because I'll take a package I'm getting near an age when I'd like to go, is that, um, is that what is the, the biggest problem of teaching writing is to understand, again, that it's not about the story that you hold. Even though you might have childhood influences, we get the best students technically. We get very good students who can write very well grammatically and technically, but considering I do writing groups outside the university, I teach a group of homeless people in St Kilda each year, and this is not being romantic, the people I teach down at St Kilda Library for four weeks every year, if I sat those people in a room and say, what's your idea for a story? They have the ideas. They don't have the technical ability. Or they, many of them don't. What a lot of students have at university that I teach is great technique, but they still haven't developed the ideas. And that you need to understand and to reiterate to an undergrad, you know, this, isn't, this is only an apprenticeship. At the end of three years of doing writing, the best that you should hope for is to think about, am I going to take my writing seriously or am I going to go off and do law or do something else? That's the, I only want students to use that three years to think, yeah, this is a serious pursuit. And then most of their life would be spent doing that outside of university. So it's to equip them possibly with making a decision, which might seem you should expect more at a university, but I refuse to sell our courses is, you know, if you do this, you'll get this guaranteed outcome, as Marie just said. You, you, can't, you can't misrepresent the limitations of what you can do. Sure. Well, look, um, we're running out of time, so I might just invite, first of all, Tony and then Maria for, to make any closing summary or statement or conclusion. <laughs> that might be a long stretch. Uh, but any parting comment? Uh, oh, well, I suppose that I would make a parting um, comment. Um, when I talk football, we just decided that. So what I will say is that um, I, anything that I said tonight, I suppose what I don't want to ever undervalue is you know, the intelligence of readers. Yeah. So whether I might think, um, have a particular view on, on fiction or the, the state of fiction in Australia, I think that readers, because I go to festivals a lot, you just get always, I get so refreshingly surprised by what readers articulate through books. And readers are much smarter than writers, I reckon. Yeah. And that, you know, you can make decisions about how you see the status of writing. And people that are well read um, are just remarkable for the insights that they provide you with, with your work. I mean, there's nothing. People say, what's the best part of being a writer? It's pretty easy. You go to a festival, someone walks up to you and says, I read Blood and I got this out of it. That's gold. I, I think, is the bookshop still open, Mike? Will they be signing? Yeah, both, both our writers will be very happy, I think, to sign multiple copies. Maria? Yeah, I said this last time I was at this festival, but people laugh, so I'm going to say it again. <laughs> I love people at festivals come up to me and say, I loved your book so much, I borrowed it to all my friends. 
Well, it didn't work that time. Never mind. Um, so, um, no, I, I, I've become uh, very interested in neurology lately mm. for special reasons of my own. And uh, one of the things I started, I now subscribe to New England Journal of Medicine and four other um, journals, med medical journals, and Psychology Today as well. But the latest fMRI scans of the human brain show that reading literary fiction, <laughs> whatever that means, that is reading that demands of the reader that um, imagine a scene rather than being told adjectival fiction or heavily descriptive fiction. Uh, what that does to the human brain is you can't beat it in terms of what it causes in the brain, the activity, uh, the synaptic activity and uh, neurotransmitters and so forth. The only thing that comes even close is learning to play a musical instrument. So reading is fantastic for your brain and also for the growth of empathy and your ability to empathise with other people and so forth. Yep. That's great news. Apparently actors, the scans showing the emotional changes in actors are identical to the good actors of those emotions if you're actually undergoing the actual experience. And perhaps mm. it's similar with fiction, Maria. Anyway, look, um, I'm going to invite Mike to say a few words in a minute, but I'd like to thank, uh, in Auslan, I'd like to thank the uh, Auslan, uh, mm. our signers today. And, uh, and perhaps, uh, and, and to thank uh, our wonderful two uh, writers who've uh, entertained us today, uh, Tony Birch and MJ Highland. And Tony Shuttleworth. But Michael Shuttleworth, I said Tony thank for some Peter. reason. Tony Birch, Michael Shuttleworth. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> um, it's just my uh, honour and privilege to say thanks to some people to close out the Edinburgh World Writers' Conference. What a mighty enterprise it has been, thanks to all the keynotes, guests and chairs, including our three tonight, Peter, Tony and Maria. Can I thanks to them, please? Um, thank you to you, the audiences, who have followed today's discussions and debates with uh, fervour and sustained interest. Thanks to the Edinburgh International Book Festival and the British Council for assisting in the uh, development and support of this uh, program over a year. Um, video transcripts of today's program and most of the proceedings of the year's conference discussion can be found at the Edinburgh World Writers Conference website. So from the Melbourne Writers Festival, I say on behalf of the Edinburgh World Writers Conference, thank you.